If you can log into your mobile phone account with just a username and a passcode, that's not enough. Even though the criminal organizations are out there predominantly for financial gain, they're also passing information that could be of use to the Russian service. And welcome to the Security Guy and CIA Spy Pod broadcast. I am Robert Ticiliano, and this is Peter Warmka. How are you doing, Robert? Hey, Peter. You're in Orlando, correct? Yeah, we've uh, had some interesting times recently. The hur hurricane that passed by, but fortunately, fortunately for us, we were we were sort of out of the the uh, you know the main the main uh, thrust of it. So we got people a bit excited. I yeah. was at a conference. I had to give a presentation. Over 16 uh, speakers canceled, and a lot of people started leaving, uh, which was unfortunate, right? But I can understand, uh, especially when they're worried about being able to get back. But So I had a much smaller group than I normally have, but it was kind of cool because it was very intimate. And I got people, we started talking about uh, cybersecurity and, and hacking and especially AI threats. People really opened up and started, you know, providing kind of like testimonials of what was going on, what they have seen, what their companies have seen, which is something I think is what we really need in the industry is those testimonials. So people realize, hey, this can happen to me. It happened to my neighbor. Yeah. I was in Orlando not too long ago presenting to uh, uh, the real estate industry and title companies on mortgage closing wire fraud. And I had a relatively small audience as well. Uh, it was a big conference, but, you know, I was up against a lot of concurrent sessions and um, the bar, right? <laughs> Meaning like there was a lot of people at the bar. And you should have moved the bar into your, like, into your room. <laughs> right? And I was like, why? And I said to them, why? when I got on the platform, I'm like, I think that this presentation, this program is the most important session in the entire conference and why isn't the room full i said because like in this event like we're talking about wire fraud as it pertains to mortgage closings that you as real estate agents rely on in order to you know get paid and exactly. if your clients are victimized by a wire fraud it it's over johnny like it's game over for you because all their funds go to a bad guy. They're not getting that money back. And so why isn't this room full? And it boils down to people don't want to think or believe it can happen to them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as I'm presenting the program, I'm getting a lot of feedback, a lot of you know audience questions and a lot of feedback from them. And what I learned was there's like 30, 40 people in the room. Of the 30, 40 people in the room, probably about... 80% of them have experienced some form of wire fraud. I believe it. Yeah. I mean, but it's a shame because people don't, are not really talking about it, right? It's like if they don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. It's just crazy. And the, so the thing is, is like the people in the room that understood the impact of the crime that wanted to know what to do to make sure it doesn't happen in the future. And the rest of them had systems in place that they wanted to make sure were robust enough. Uh, that's who showed up. So those that essentially were either affected by the crime or knew enough about it that understood the risks and wanted to further mitigate it are the ones that showed up. You know, mm -hmm. and that's essentially who our audience is. It's like those who recognize risk and want to do something about it, like the people who stayed in the room, right, for your event, uh, are the ones that, you know, but it's like everybody else is a huge target because they're not doing anything about it. Well, sometimes it's the fault of the of the conference organizers that they don't necessarily understand the importance of the individual sessions and so how they how they how they structure the locations as well as the specific time i mean it can make a big difference regarding uh what kind of turnout you're going to get it's just and you and i should be a keynote for every single presentation that we deliver i agree the entire conference needs to hear what we have to say because it's not just like oh you know uh put that you know speaker on what on mortgage wire fraud up against six other speakers because like those five other programs are good, but they're not to the degree of, of the of the the importance of anything that we you and I collectively present. Ever. That's what we continue to do battle, Robert. That's our mission. 
And we're doing battle today. So, hey, everybody, uh, welcome. And uh, we have all kinds of interesting topics to speak to. Uh, right here, uh, Politico talks about officials unveil unprecedented cybercrime takedown. U.S. law enforcement has unraveled the CACBOT malware, which cyber criminals use to cause millions in damages via ransomware and data theft. So this is an interesting one, Peter. Uh, let me uh, go a little deeper with the senior Justice Department officials on Tuesday revealed a major digital sting that carried out to squash malware criminals you have used for decades to launch ransomware attacks, break into corporate networks, and filch sensitive customer data across the globe. They called it unprecedented, involving FBI agents and law enforcement partners in six other countries, including France, United Kingdom, Germany, Netherlands, Romania, and Latvia. The only ones that I'm surprised that I'm seeing in here is Romania and Latvia, because, you know, those are countries where a lot of cybercrime emanates from. But that's great that we're getting that level of cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, they issued commands, the, the CAC bot malware issued commands to self-destruct and ultimately they uh, seized roughly $9 million worth of cryptocurrency behind the malware. So I wanted to point out something specific here. U.S. officials have repeatedly warned that a large percentage of global cybercrime and ransomware activity comes from Russia. They accused the Kremlin of turning a blind eye to digital crooks as long as they focus their activity abroad, a claim Russia denies. China also accounts for significant hacking activity within the United States, but authorities say a majority of it is state-sponsored, meaning the Chinese government also denies sanctioning hacking efforts. Mm -hmm. I think that's I, I think that's very, very true. Uh, the first part about, about Russia uh, allowing these organizations to operate as long as they're not targeting a, individuals or companies within in Russia. I mean, uh, we talked about this before. There's a lot of criminal organizations that do have for, have former uh, intelligence officers I mean, uh, that work for them. At the, and there's also a lot of cooperation between the intelligence services in Russia and these criminal organizations. Uh, and I'm sure that the even though the criminal organizations are out there predominantly for, you know, conduct their activities for financial gain, they're also passing information that could be of use to the Russian service. And regarding the China, yes, I think it's a lot more of that is being conducted by by the state. Absolutely. That is, ladies and gentlemen, uh, directly from the uh, retired former CIA uh, spy uh, who would know more about this than uh, probably the top 1% of the people on the planet, right? So it well, goes on to say that, what, what's that, Peter? No, I would like to, I mean, like to add that this, I mean, it's nice to see, it's nice to see some of these victories, right? Uh, it, it's significant, they should report them and, and they really can't, or they shouldn't report too much detail on how they undertake the operation, the takedown, because that provides information back to the criminals or fraudsters and being able to operate, you know, more intelligently to circumvent uh, these these practices by law enforcement, right? It's a, but it's still a small dent. This is one you know great victory, but it's very small in comparison to all of the, you know the global operations of these criminal groups in in and and uh, you know these hacks that are going on. The level of detail that they did provide was over the course of the 18 month operation, U.S. and international law enforcement clandestinely gained access to the 52 servers controlling CACBOT. That gave them a unique behind the curtain look at how much damage the malware was causing. Cyber criminals infected 700,000 new victims with, with the malware over the past year alone, roughly 200,000 of which were in the US according to law enforcement. They also used it to launch 40 different ransomware attacks causing $58 million in damage. So interestingly, that they got access to all those servers and ultimately that allowed them to shut them down. But does it say anything regarding the arrests of individuals? It doesn't. As a matter um, of fact, they said specifically, uh, there was some information here that, uh, hold on. U.S. law enforcement did not announce any arrests when asked who they believed to be responsible for the botnet. Uh, they, they declined to say, citing the ongoing nature of the investigation. The fact that they had seized as much cryptocurrency as they did tells me that either 
that crypto was residing on one of those servers that they were able to capture, or they actually got somebody, they actually got inside somebody's account and or got someone. Uh, so that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, hopefully, hopefully they, it leads to some arrest because otherwise it's pretty easy for these groups just to set up shop again. Uh, well, continue. that's it. Yeah. Uh, it is a game of whack-a-mole. And uh, the fact that they were able to shut down 52 different servers is a, is a coup, but uh, mm -hmm. they've got to get the people that are responsible for doing it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So check this out. So crawl employee SIM swapped for crypto investor data. So this is via Security Boulevard and um, uh, journalist uh, Brian Krebs. So security consulting giant Kroll, and we'll explain SIM swapping in a minute to y'all, disclosed today that a SIM swapping attack against one of its employees led to the theft of user information of multiple cryptocurrency platforms that are relying on Kroll services in their ongoing bankruptcy proceedings. And there are indications that fraudsters may already be exploiting the stolen data and phishing attacks. So a uh, cryptocurrency lender BlockFi and now the collapsed uh, trading platform FTX each disclosed data breaches this week. Thanks to recent SIM swapping attacks targeting an employee, a single employee of Kroll, the company, uh, which is handling the bankruptcy restructuring. So and a statement released New York based Kroll I mean, this is a huge security company, said it was informed on August 19th, someone targeted a T-Mobile phone number belonging to a Kroll employee in a highly sophisticated SIM swapping attack. Specifically, they said T-Mobile, without any authority from or contact with the Kroll or its employees, transferred the employee's phone number to the threat actor's phone at their requests. The statement continues, as a result, it appears the threat actor gained access to certain files containing personal information of bankruptcy claims in the matter of BlockFi, FTX, and Genesis. So, Peter, I'm actually, like, involved uh, as an expert witness in a similar case. Uh, mm -hmm. Sim swapping is when the criminal, in this case, hacker, let's say, or criminal, uh, calls up T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, posing as the actual, you know, account holder. So think like, let's just say you're an AT&T customer and you have, you know, obviously a phone and uh, that phone is used for uh, two-factor authentication in many accounts. And let's just say for your bank account, or in this case, cryptocurrency. Okay. And so when you uh, are going to log into your crypto account, you log in, username, passcode, and then you get a text message, one-time passcode via your phone. And that allows you to log in to any account that requires two-factor authentication. Well, in this case, it's an employee of Kroll that uh, is responsible for uh, the security of various clients and at some level, that employee was provided access to those client accounts. Now, what the bad guys had, had done was they went to T-Mobile and they said, hey, we are so-and-so employee of Kroll and we need to uh, you know, change out our phone because our phone was lost or stolen. So uh, here is my username and passcode for my, in this case, T-Mobile account. And they went ahead and used basic information about that employee along with his credentials that they may have fished or got elsewhere and ultimately were able to take over that T-Mobile account and get a SIM card for that T-Mobile account that had resided on the victim's phone and transferred it to another phone that the mm -hmm. bad guys controlled. Y'all understand how that works? You know, I mean, that's interesting, but I mean, it, it's always the possibility that it could have been, you know, uh, an inside job regarding the, the telephone company, right? That that would have provided this information. I mean, it's not that hard to recruit somebody uh, on the inside of these organizations for the right, you know, mo motivations and the right money. I'm not saying that this is the case, but, it, it, you know, it could be a very successful 
uh, phishing scam. But all, another question would be is how did they know that this individual had this type of access? Is that a is that sort of a deficiency on the part of the the company in allowing that type of information to to leak out of of them? See, I don't know if they actually knew that that employee had that level of access. Huh. Um, I'm thinking that they would target a number of people within the company regardless, knowing that these are uh, individuals that have access to a lot of high net worth uh, individuals and accounts. And any one of them in the, in the company would be a significant target. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about like Could be. any... Anybody that works for the FBI, anybody that works for a, a massive bank, anybody that works for a massive crypto company, like all of those individual employees have access that they could leverage any of those employees to get access to any amounts of uh, sensitive, highly valuable information. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So for any of us that want to avoid this, OK, um, knowing that companies like T-Mobile and others can go in and provide a SIM card to anyone that poses as you, I think it's important that you have multiple layers of protection on your mobile phone accounts themselves. So mm -hmm. right now, if you can log into your mobile phone account right now with just a username and a passcode, that's not enough. Not enough at all. Oh. And it's possible that this employee to log into his own T-Mobile account only had username and passcode access to get in and may not have enabled two-factor authentication. That is entirely a possibility. Because okay. it, with a lot of these companies, it's it's still an op it's still an option, right? They don't they don't require you if you don't want to to use two-factor authentication. Although I mean, we're strong advocates for it, but Maybe some people won't until they're forced to. So I enabled an additional passcode on my AT&T account probably 15 years ago. Hmm. 15 years ago, I said to at and I'm like, hey, listen, like at any given point in time, you know, like anybody can log into my account if they have my passcode, right? And they were like, yeah. I go, can I add like an additional passcode onto my account? They actually had to set that up for me specifically because hmm. they didn't even have two-factor authentication back in the day. I, believe I was that. like, right now, in order to authenticate me, all they need to know is like my mother's maiden name or the last four digits of my social security number. Like, that's it. I go, can I change things up so it's like a different code altogether so that like nobody can access my account unless they know a specific code? Because all of these like easy to guess, easy to hack, easy to crack credentials aren't enough. And that's what mm -hmm. I did. Mm -hmm. okay. They probably thought that you were totally exaggerated at that time, you know, but exactly. You were, you're, you're way ahead of the curve regarding so these things. For all of you, I would find out right now what it takes to get access to your mobile phone account right now. Like mm -hmm. call them up and like pose as somebody else. You know, I, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Pose as you pose as yourself and try to get in. Like say, hey, I lost my phone or I can't find it or I need to like get a new SIM card. Like how do I go about that? What do I got to do? And find out what type of information based on that phone call they need in order for you or anyone else to get access to your account. Mm -hmm. And if you determine that it's relatively easy for somebody to get in, get in based on relatively known information that, be, that could be gleaned off of Facebook or found on the web, you know you got a problem right there, and you need to beef up access to your account. Very good advice, Robert. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Uh, clock is ticking. So uh, this is also via Security Boulevard, and this is fighting back against synthetic identity fraud. Peter, most people don't know what synthetic identity fraud is. We're going to we're going to define that for everyone and give you an idea of what it is that you should do to protect yourself. This particular article is really for um, you know, larger Fortune 1000s, you know, financial institutions on what they're supposed to do to prevent 
their clients, people like you mm -hmm. and I, from being victimized from this particular crime. But we'll break it down in such a way where we define it for you and what it is that you could do to protect yourself, even if you can. So as COVID-19 uh, raged, uh, Adam Arena, uh, this guy was getting rich. However, he wasn't running a prosperous business uh, that was thriving despite pandemic uncertainty. Instead, Arena and a dozen co-conspirators were stealing more than $1 million from financial institutions using a fraud scheme called synthetic identity fraud. This fraud approach is the fastest growing in a long line of fraud techniques, uh, is especially prevalent in financial services arena among threat actors leveraging stolen credentials to make money, our information. So the Federal Reserve defines synthetic identity fraud as the use of a combination of personally identifiable information, PII, name, address, phone number, social security number, to fabricate a person or entity in order to commit a dishonest act for financial or personal gain. Unlike identity theft, which a fraudster uses a specific individual's stolen yet real information, fraudsters create synthetic identities by combining elements of real and fictitious PII, this identity is then used to obtain a loan or extensive credit line, but it's never paid back. So basically what this is, is your name, your address, your phone number, your social security number. Now, you are a, le a legitimate person. Now, your neighbor or somebody in another state, for that matter, has similar information. Now, what they might use is your name and your address and somebody else's social security number mm -hmm. entirely, okay? Mm -hmm. It might have a similar name or feel to your name, like Robert Siciliano could be Bob Siciliano, but it's another Bob Siciliano from another state with a different social security number and so on, but your physical address. And the two may not match up on the credit bureau's information and new lines of credit could be established with a combination of both records, right? My, my Bob Siciliano, another Robert Siciliano, different social security number, different address, combine them. And in some cases, a different address altogether, a different name altogether. And by combining all of this real data in different ways, they're basically creating new lines of credit, new credit reports based on a combination of names, personal identifying information, and numeric identifiers, social security numbers. Mm -hmm. I would think, I mean, you mentioned that most of this is uh, the concern would be, you know, it's the weight upon the uh, financial institutions and maybe the consumers think, well, what can I do about it? But I can see one thing right now. Uh, the risk is if there's a synthetic identity that's linked to your social security number, that is where all of a sudden a credit line could be taken out under your your social security number, right? I mean, under your name, uh, but it, this is important. If you lock down your credit, you don't even have to worry about this, correct? Well, see, so the problem here is that if you lock, if you lock down your credit, which everybody should do right now, your name, your, your credit is associated with your social security number. So you need to get a credit freeze. Everybody needs to get a credit freeze yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Now that protects you and your credit from being affected by this. But what happens is, they are able to open up new lines of credit under a brand new identity that's used in combination of yours and others. And the credit bureaus actually establish a whole new identity based on a combination of information uh -huh. that isn't actually you and doesn't actually show up on your credit report. Understood. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, any advice about how uh, we as consumers can try to counteract this, you know, defeat this? It's kind of, it's pretty difficult, right? Uh, it is. Our information is already out there. The good news is, is that generally it doesn't ultimately affect you specifically in your line of credit and your actual identity in such a way where it affects your ability going forward to uh, get credit because it's a whole brand new identity. However, uh, if your credit is not frozen and they can eventually tap into your actual identity as well. So with your credit being frozen, 
you can you can prevent synthetic identity theft from affecting your actual identity. And in the end, it's the lenders, it's the creditors right. that lose the most because they have granted credit essentially to what would be considered a ghost, even though that data is in some way associated with your identity. It's further enough away that it's a synthetic identity that isn't actually you. But as we know, when there are laws, when there are companies such as financial institutions included that lose money on some of these things, they have to make it up. And so it's ultimately it becomes, you know, we all pay the price ultimately in the, in the, the, you know, for what we pay in the products and services. So what they're saying is data breaches have continued unabated for several years. In 2022, more than 1,800 data compromises events impacted 422 million people, exposing PII and other critical information that threat actors leveraged to commit synthetic identity theft, fraud, and other crimes. So basically, cyber attacks, the dark web, various forms of identity theft, various fraud scams, account takeover, all of that is... All that data from all those various sources is used for various forms of synthetic identity theft. So everybody, get a credit freeze right now and protect you. There could be, at any given point in time, a half a dozen people or more dozens using your actual social security number, using your actual name, maybe not combined with your social, to actually have various accounts under your name that won't affect you. But fundamentally, as long as you get a credit freeze, that pretty much protect, protects mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, Peter, what are you up to these days? Oh, boy. This is like the time of the year when things really start getting getting extremely busy. As you know, it's been very difficult for us to even communicate because of everything that we're involved in. A lot of uh, travel um, for conferences, uh, groups, associations, private companies. And, you know, Cybersecurity Month is coming up. And Cybersecurity Awareness Month is coming up in October. So a lot of things happening. But that being said, if any of you listening are working for companies that maybe haven't prepared or thought about Cyber Awareness uh, Month and are looking for resources, please you know, reach out to Robert or myself. We might be able to, to assist in some way, uh, in giving a presentation, even if it's virtual, to your, your organization. Yeah, and you can see Peter at counterintelligence-institute.com. And check out his book on Amazon. This is a, a new one. Peter, it is Why Are You Messing With Me? Senior Survival Guide on Fraud, Privacy, and Security. How's it doing, Peter? Thank you. Very well. Actually, when people, you know, I when I they see the, the book's cover, they say, this is exactly what my parents need or my grandparents need. And they start relating to me. They had this issue coming up, you know, or I, I, I found them, you know, doing getting involved in this. And I said, wait a minute. You know, this is a scam. So everybody seems to have a story. It's yeah, really everybody's got a story. Everybody has a story. Yeah, about how yeah. they're, you know, they just the keep coming in too. Yes. Like it's just, oh, yeah. All right. So for uh, me, uh, you guys just contact me at protectnowllc.com. Uh, we are doing lots within the real estate industry, uh, mortgage, uh, financial services. Uh, September, October for both Peter and I are very busy, uh, but uh, we know most people are booking for 2024 at this point. Feel free to touch base anytime. Peter, any last words? Well, just stay safe out there, and hopefully uh, you're not going to have to worry about these hurricanes that pass through Florida, but uh, there's there's a lot of things going on, uh, and just be careful. Take care of each other, and we'll see you next time. And be nice to each other. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Thank you.